Join me in this responsive greeting this morning. Come, here is the one thing we seek. Here we dwell in the house of the Lord and gaze on God's beauty. Good morning and welcome to Snohomish United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Janelle Kurtz and it is good to be gathered together in worship this morning. Leading us, Jim Bohm is providing our music and has already centered us quite well. Tom Lafferty will help us in leading our congregational singing and Linda Heaster is our liturgist helping us to hear the word of God. When we come and worship, it is all of our hearts gathered together before God in prayer and in praise and in fellowship with one another. That is the mark of worship, something we create together. This morning, there are a couple of announcements that I want to highlight before we continue in our time together. You may hear more about this first one during our prayers. We're continuing to hold in prayer all those impacted by wildfires, particularly those in uh, Maui, UMCOR, which is our relief efforts in the Methodist Church, is already at work there. And so there are ways if you want to support those efforts, you can give through UMCOR and mark it for Maui and it will go accordingly. You'll see information about that in our weekly communications, but I want to make wanted to name it in this space. Community Kitchen, which is a local way in which we serve and have been serving our community. They are celebrating that September 11th, they will be able to return to service in person at St. John's Episcopal Church. And so we give thanks for that. Uh, you may know that COVID forced them to make alternative plans and then construction at St. John's continued those. So we celebrate that they have continued their uh, feeding to our community and are able to return to that in person. You saw on the announcement slides that on Friday is a movie night. I hope you'll come. We're watching Encanto. We're gonna talk about Encanto on Sunday during worship. So if you haven't seen it, this is a chance to see it together. So that's Friday at 6.30. Related to that, there is a survey in your bulletin and I invite you to give attention to it. You can put it in the offering plate later or give it to the church office. You know that throughout this summer worship series, there have been times in worship I've asked you to shout out something. And next week, we're going to talk about things that we don't talk about. So I thought they may not be things we want to shout out. So this is still a chance for you to be able to offer some of the things, good, bad, and different, that you did not talk about in your families growing up. There's also a question for looking ahead for our last week of the worship series of what are those things that really ground us in faith? The scriptures are those songs that come back to again and again that hold us. So I give thanks for those who have already given attention to this and invite your attention this morning. Those are the announcements that I bring before us. We continue in worship. And as always, I invite you to worship in the way that is best for you. You're invited to rise in body or spirit for our call to worship. God, whose hand shapes us at our creation, yours is the hand that guides us every day. When we wander far from your ways, pull us back to you. When we wrestle with fear and doubt and hope, do not let us go. Though the night drags on and shadows are long, teach us the blessing of holding on. We join now in our opening song, O Lord, You're Beautiful, number 2064, in the faith we sing, and it's also on the screen. So let us sing together.
You may be seated. This morning, we will hear the story of Jacob and Esau reunited. It has been 20 years since they last saw each other. At that time, Jacob tricked their father into receiving Esau's firstborn blessing. Jacob fled and found refuge, family, and more trickery with Laban. Now God has instructed Jacob to return to his homeland. The story picks up with Jacob making preparations to meet Esau. Hear this story from Genesis chapter 32. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies thinking, if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, for he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him and he himself spent that night in the camp. These are the holy words for all God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us join in the spirit of prayer. God of every good promise and every sacred blessing, we give thanks that your grace is not given in accordance with our actions. Rather, you give out of your steadfastness. Our fear and brokenness and bargaining ways do not earn nor discredit your faithfulness towards us. You made good on your promise to Jacob, and we ask that you make good on your promises to us and all creation. Let your kingdom come and make us hold fast through all the long night until its arrival comes in full. Amen. At this time, would the children come forward? for the time together. Good morning. Come on over. Good morning, how are you guys today? Good, good to see you. Today, we are going to talk about something that everyone in this room has. 
Want to guess? Hmm. Joy. Oh, that'd be a nice one. I would love, I hope that that is true, that everyone in this room has joy. That's a beautiful thing. It's actually, it's kind of, we're going to talk about names. I think everyone here has a name. Looks like it. Do you all have names? I'm wondering, do you know what your name means or if there's any kind of story behind your name? Some of us know and some of us don't. You know, do you? What does your name mean or what story do you know of your name? Your name, yeah, your name comes from a, from a longer name that means protector or helper for people. Yeah. Does anyone else here know their name, a story behind their name? It could be what it means or it could just be a story behind how you got it. You, you used to, but you don't remember. That's all right, Donna. I'm sure there are other people who may remember for you. You were named for your great grandmother. That's beautiful. For your father. Uh huh. For your aunt. Yeah, so our names, I wanted to talk about names because our names tell us something about who we are, but they can also tell us a story that connects us to other people. And whenever we read the Bible and someone gets a new name in a story, this happens a lot in the Bible. When someone gets a new name, it usually means that they have a new job to do for God or a different way of serving God and praising God. And so we're gonna hear a story. We started it already. Jacob, he's going to meet his brother and he's a little bit afraid because he was a tricky brother and took his brother's blessing, his good things, and then ran off. And so he's scared to come back because you know he thinks his brother is gonna have something to say about that. And so we're gonna hear the second half of the story where Jacob's going to have a dream, and he's going to end up wrestling with God. That's what the story is about. And when it is over, God gives Jacob a new name. Do you know what his new name is? His new name is Israel. And it means to strive or struggle or wrestle with, with God and with people and to prevail, to overcome. So it's someone who maybe works hard or doesn't give up on something or sticks with something and comes out on top, even when it doesn't always seem like that's how it's going to be. And so in the end, his, with his brother, he will have a, his brother, he will reunite and it'll lead to joy. It won't just lead to his brother being angry. There'll be a change in that. But all of us share a little bit in Israel's story because when we believe that Jesus helped make us part of Israel's story. So we are also people who don't give up on God. And because of that, we believe that God's promises will last. All the good things that bring joy and love in the world will continue. And so we are people, that's why we come to church together. That's why we remember that we are connected to others. We don't do this all by ourselves. We don't give up on God, and we believe God does, does not give up on us either. And that's pretty good news, isn't it? Even when it gets really hard to hold on, or we wrestle, or we have doubt, still, we don't give up on God, and God doesn't give up on us. Can we say a prayer together? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the names that those in our lives have given to us, that connect us to each other, that remind us who we are, and even the nicknames that remind us of something lovely that we share. Help us to remember that we always share in the name, too, of Israel. Those who don't give up will keep on going for your promises. Amen. Thank you so much. Head on back. Jacob's story continues. While waiting in the night for his brother Esau to arrive, he wrestles a blessing from God. 
hear the story in Genesis 32 and 33. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. These are the holy words for all God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, we are coming into the home stretch of our summer fun in the sun worship series. We remember that every week has been inspired by a summertime activity, most of them from my own childhood, though they seem to connect across yours as well. I want to remind you as we come into the home stretch where we've been. We began by exploring Sabbath and the kind of grace that marks us as our own. That was the week when we explored faith on the hammock. And from there, we went and toiled in the garden to learn lessons of love that God teaches us there. We had a picnic with the Holy Spirit and explored the abundance, the fruitfulness of the Spirit's work in our lives. We traveled, we explored, we remembered that every single place we go, is already a place God is. And we imagined what would be different if we took that truth seriously. If we took seriously that everywhere God already is. And from there, the last time I was with you two weeks ago, we explored Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom, a place where play flourishes, where children are front and center. And we were given the very difficult task of playing well and doing the sacred work of protecting the right to play for all of God's children. Last week, we explored faith on the waters. Melissa Marzoff was here as our guest preacher, and she invited us with a message on boating to come and trust God, even where feet may fail, to hold forth with trust in the face of fear. You may hear some of that this morning echoed today, too. So this week, as we begin, I want to invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath and remember, remember where we've been, the stories we have shared, the 
stories we have retold, maybe even your own experiences of summer, giving thanks to God for the gifts of them. Let's take another deep breath here. With gratitude before God. And as we come back to this space, I'm going to invite you, as you open your eyes, to go ahead and tilt your head. Some of you are doing it. I love this. Tilt your head a little. Squint your eyes. Because as my friend said, this week is a stretch. So go ahead, strain your eyes to see it with me. I am calling this week Faith in the Night, and it is a nod to all the childhood sleepovers I had and how they were the best in the summer. So go ahead, strain your eyes to see the connection there. It is a bit of a stretch, my friends have said. You can stop tilting your head if you would like. But my friends, I trust God's spirit meets us in this space. As I said, today is about faith in the night. And I remember all those childhood sleepovers I had. Summer was the best time for them. Summer was the best time for them because without school, It meant that long days playing didn't have to end. Spontaneous sleepovers could happen in the summer, even on a weekday, and it was glorious. I remember days when I would spend all day out riding my bike with my friends, and then we would dump our bikes on a lawn and go and catch fireflies until it was dark and our parents called us in. And instead of having to go home, we could stay together. And then in the night, we could whisper our secrets in the dark and giggle long past the time when parents told us it was time to go to sleep. Those are some happy memories. You see, in the same way that we talked about a picnic is somehow different from eating dinner at a table inside, there's something expansive, something changes when we take the meal outside. I believe there's something different in a friendship after a sleepover. Happens. I mean, I think we know this as adults. In our adult relationships, there's an intimacy of pillow talk. There's an intimacy of sharing around a campfire at night. We practice these same things, I think, as children at sleepovers. We practice the trust of midnight confessions. There's a different intimacy when you wake up in the middle of, or early in the morning, bleary eyed not yet put together. There's something different about it. And so this week, we are going to explore what is different as well, faith in the night. Not only in our friendships is this true, I believe there's something different in our faith in the night with God. And so this morning we heard stories, well, we heard a story of Jacob wrestling with God. Uh, For the sake of today, squinting and reaching a bit. This is a sleepover with God. You can go with that. You can go with that. And it is God's sleepover with Jacob. Because it is God who shows up to Jacob in this story. It's not the first time either. You probably remember another time God showed up to Jacob. Jacob's ladder. We talk about that. We remember this story When Jacob was first fleeing from his brother Esau, when he had just tricked his brother and his father out of blessing, and he was on the run, he laid down to sleep in the night, and he was met with a vision of a ladder, stretching between heaven and earth, divine messengers going up and down all night long. And at the end of it, God appeared and said a blessing upon Jacob, a promise for him. God promised to give Jacob the land he was sleeping on. God promised to make Jacob as numerous as the sand of the sea, the dust of the earth. God promised to be with Jacob, to protect him, to accompany him never to leave him until the promise came to pass. When Jacob woke up, he celebrated and he praised and he set up an altar and he worshiped God in that place. And he gave it a new name. 
He called that place Bethel. But that was 20 years ago. Now Jacob is on his way back home. God's promises are already underway in Jacob's life. He is perhaps not yet as many as the sand of the sea, but he is getting there. He is returning with many children and flocks and family with him. But of course, now he has to come back home, which means confronting the past. It means coming back and meeting Esau, who apparently is coming to greet him with 400 men. A sure sign of great welcome or a terrible, terrible threat. So Jacob is terrified. He prays a prayer to God that is part bargaining. Remember the children, God. You wouldn't do this to the children, to the mothers. Remember the promise you made to me. Keep your promise. He cries out, and he laments, and he grieves, and he is afraid. But he also has a plan, because Jacob is a trickster, he is clever, he is conniving, and he always has been. And so he has a plan, too. So he has his prayer to God, and he also has the way he is going to schmooze Esau with the gifts. I'm going to send this gift first, and then another wave, and then another wave, and another wave. I cut out part of the story, because it's just like, here's a gift, here's another gift. Here's another gift. Jacob is going to try and win his brother over. He will even bow down many times in humility, perhaps feigned humility for Jacob. But all the same, he has his plan, just enough to make it for God's promise to come to pass, just enough to make it through another day. And then he finally finds a quiet place to lay down and sleep or at least to lay down and anxiously toss and turn until the morning comes. And he has to meet his brother. And it is there, in that moment, that once again, God shows up to meet him. Of course, in this meeting, there are no pleasant dreams and easy blessings. This one is a time of tireless wrestling in the night. There is no sleep at this sleepover. There is only a stalemate of wrestling. Jacob, who will not let go of the mystery person we understand to be God. God, who will not let go of Jacob. And so they are locked together in the stalemate. Until finally, when dawn is coming, God saves Jacob from himself. And my friend says God cheats and injures him. And even still, Jacob doesn't let go. But I said that God saves Jacob from himself in this moment because we know that to see God face to face in the broad daylight is a dangerous thing. There aren't many who survive it. The darkness obscures God's face just enough that perhaps Jacob can survive it. So God tells him you must you must let go of this wrestling now. But still, Jacob doesn't, cannot, will not let go, holds on tight, and demands another blessing. Perhaps it's a way to guarantee an answer to his prayer. Maybe this is how he thinks he'll get the answer that he wants. And God answers and gives him a blessing and a new name. No longer Jacob. You are Israel. You have struggled with God and with humanity and have overcome. You have won. You have wrestled and prevailed. You are the one who strive with God, with people. Jacob rises from the sleepover and he faces a new morning and he goes with a new name and a new blessing and a limp. But immediately, immediately the new name true, proves to be true. There's something, my a friend of mine talks about how we live into our names. It's true in this story. Immediately when Jacob meets Esau, 
there is not the devastation or the violence or the anger that he was afraid of. Instead, there becomes reconciliation. Esau and, uh, and Jacob, they weep. It is a sign of mercy, a sign of forgiveness. His name comes to fruition. You are one who has striven and wrestled and yet, and yet somehow prevailed. Yet somehow promise comes out on the other side of it. And so all those gifts, that Jacob had prepared as a bribe for his brother. They become gifts given in gratitude. Gratitude for mercy extended. Gratitude for forgiveness shown. Gratitude for a chance to start again. Jacob is changed by faith in the night, by his sleepovers with God. He awakes a different person. When I think about the sleepovers that I had as a child, there is one that is etched in my memory. I was going to my friend's house. They were sisters. They lived five houses and one empty lot away from me. I know because I counted the houses countless times on the sidewalk, going to and from their house. This wasn't the first time I was staying over at their house. But this time, something was different, and I got scared. And so the lights went out, and there were shadows, and the curtains flowed ominously, and there were sounds I didn't recognize, and the whole thing was just unfamiliar to me. And I was scared of the dark. I was scared of the night. So I tried to bury myself in my blanket, but I just cried and cried and cried, terrified tears of a child. Until finally I knew I wasn't going to make it. I needed to go home. I don't remember how it happened. One of the sisters woke up. Somehow parents were called, and eventually I packed my things, and I crept down the stairs, and I walked outside, and I was expecting relief. But immediately, as soon as I was outside, I thought I had made a terrible mistake. Because the night was just as scary. The dark was just as deep outside of the room. My friends were already back asleep in their room. My mom was a robed figure in the distance. She was waiting in the driveway. I'm pretty sure she was half asleep. That was as far as she was getting the driveway. And she watched me as I walked. But I walked so scared. My breath caught. I was clammy. I was shaky. Every sound, I jumped. And some of you know me. I am a jumper. Everything made me jump. Everything made me look behind me, expecting the boogeyman to come and snatch me in the night. Those five houses and one empty lot seemed an impossible distance to travel in the night alone. I had made a mistake. Why didn't I just stay? Why didn't I stick it out? When I got to the halfway point, a white house with a flagpole and three poodles, I decided I couldn't take it any longer and I buried my face in the sleeping bag and I ran the rest of the way without looking. (laughs) I made it, fortunately. When you travel a trail long enough, you know it's steps. But oh, there might have been relief eventually. Eventually, when I got into that room, into my own bed, maybe. But I remember falling asleep and just feeling still scared, still regretful, wishing I had stuck it out, feeling like I had given up something good to come home to something I already knew. I felt like I let go of the blessing of making it to morning with my friends. Jacob's sleepovers, they couldn't be any more different from each other. The one is full of easy, pleasant dreams, easy won blessings from God that show up at just the right moment when he needs it most. And the other one is basically its own nightmare, full of wrestling and fear and restlessness, of desperation and bargaining and the long, terrifying nights 
that we know. And yet it, somehow it is the same God who meets Jacob in both of them. The same God who comes to Jacob to bless him in both of them. The same God who will not let him go in both of them. Because that's who God is, the God who will not let him go. When I think about Jacob's stories, they remind me that faith, especially faith in the night, the dark night of our souls, those hard, restless nights that we live with, it reminds me that faith in those nights, it is not static, it is not stagnant, it does not look only one singular way. Sometimes there are beautiful, joyful, surprising, grace-filled moments that will sweep us up, that will give us promise, give us hope, will see us through to the next morning easily when we need it the most. Beautiful blessings that meet us. And then there are long, fearful nights where all we can do are bury our heads and pray and hold on and close our eyes till the tears squeeze out of them. And all we can do is hold on. Trusting God holds on to us, too. There was a time in my life when I was younger, when I believed that to plead and to bargain and to wrestle and to cry out was somehow to fail at faith. That I was somehow losing the faith. And yet, all of these things, I believe, are different ways of wrestling, different ways of holding on to a God who we believe holds on to us. All of these are ways of believing in God's promises, which are so steadfast and so good that we won't settle for anything else. And so we ask God, remember your promises. There is deep and abiding and steadfast faith in the night to hold on to a God who has been who God always has been, the God who is the great I am, the God who promises a kingdom of peace and promise and reconciliation and hope and healing. There is faith in believing God's promises will not fail nor fall despite all that is dark, despite all that is fearful. Despite all that leaves us tossing and turning, despite all the shadows and sounds that leave us jumping, we trust the unseen morning will yet come. My friends, blessings not always easily won, not always neatly secured. It doesn't always come with a bow on top. We can hardly tell sometimes when it's coming till it's there. And yet somehow, in our faith, we believe there's blessing in the striving, even when it leaves us walking with a limp. Because you remember, because of Jesus, I talked about this with the kids already, because of Jesus, we are grafted into this story, the promise, the naming of Jacob, who is Israel which means we, we too, are those who will strive and struggle and prevail. Because God's promises always prevail. Though the night is long. <clears throat> because it is God who will not let go of Jacob as surely as it is Jacob who will not let go of God. It is God who will not let go of us either. Dear church, we might go limping with bags under our eyes, tired, into the new morning, into the dawn of God's kingdom come. But my friends, the promise of new life, the promise of reconciliation, the promise of resurrection, the promise of hope, these things like Esau will come running to greet us. They will come ready to hold us in their own embrace and we may weep at the goodness of it. And I can tell you this, 
I can tell you that limping into the dawn sure beats running blind through the night because you're too afraid to take your face out of the sleeping bag. As we close, I want to end with this poem. So here are the words by Pastor Steve Garnis Holmes from his uh, reflections he writes on unfolding light. The poem is called Struggle. And as I read it, remember that it is set in struggling with God. And so here it is. We trust a shadowed God who seizes us in lonely places, who comes to us in travail, and who births us only in great labor. There is no struggle in which blessing is not enfolded in the mystery. There is no tribulation in which God is not reworking the clay. There is no wound without the power of healing. Therefore, the prayer, the prayer of the faithful is not that our lives be easy, but always and only this, I will not let go until you bless me. Of the struggles life thrusts upon you, do not let go until you get from them a blessing and become limping, perhaps, a new person with a new name. May it be so for us now and always. Amen. Our hymn of response invites us into this same holding on. I invite you to join in singing Faith is Patience in the Night. It's number 2211 in the Faith We Sing. It's also on the slides that's at the screen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing. You may be seated. I'm reminded that we do not hold on to faith alone. When I asked you about your names, how many of you shared stories of other people, of ancestors? And even when we share in the name of Israel, it is not one man's name any longer. 
It is the name of all God's people striving together for God's kingdom. And so I remind you of that for those who are going through hard times that it feels like holding on alone is impossible. We do not hold on alone. And for those of you who are in a season where you have more to give, I invite you to care for one another well in the midst of it. The gifts that we give to God, both this morning and with the whole of our lives, are one way in which we reflect that we are not giving up on God's kingdom come. We are committed to seeing God's promises come to pass. And we will keep wrestling with them until they do. And so, my friends, as our ushers come forward, I invite you to give as you can. And as I remind you each week, the gifts we give go far beyond what can be represented in an offering plate. They are the whole of the way in which we live and serve and love in our communities. So let us give faithfully today and always. And this is also a time you can raise your prayers uh, for the community. At this time, those can go in the offering plate too. There are yellow prayer cards in most of the pews. Would our ushers please come forward? give thanks that you are a God of resurrection and of new life and of promises which are steadfast. Even in the darkness of night, we trust the coming of your kingdom that will come with the brightness of dawn. May these gifts we offer this day and those that we represent in the whole of our lives, may they go with your spirit's power to testify to the coming of the light. May they go to help us and others hold on to the good news of your kingdom come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to remain in a spirit of prayer. (coughs) 
As we hear the prayers of our community, that we use the refrains, Lord, in your mercy or Lord, in your grace, and we respond, hear our prayer. A number of folks remind us to be in prayer for all those who are impacted by natural disasters right now, including Hurricane Hillary, those in that path too. Lord, in your mercy. Karen Manley raises up prayer. We've been uh, holding in prayer her grandnephew Emery, who's, and he is now preparing for an infusion of immune cells to, trivi, to treat his severe combined immune deficiency. We remember that he had been waiting on, I believe, bone marrow transplant. Lord, in your mercy. Donna Rice offers prayers for a friend, Julie, who had brain surgery and is recovering but experiencing tremendous pain. We pray for relief, Lord, in your mercy. Donna also offers a gratitude for Operation Full Bellies and thanks for the school supplies that we've already given and will continue to give. Lord, in your grace. And I would invite a prayer for my dad who just has some things going on and could use some extra prayer. So that is for Kurt, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray and we sing, let your kingdom come. Remember that it also comes in us, through us. And so, Lord, make us steadfast in bringing forth your kingdom and holding forth to your promises. Lord, we remember that your kingdom comes and it is for the whole of creation. Hope, not just for humanity, but for the whole of all that you have created, of all that lives and breathes and brings delight to us. Lord, we pray for restoration, for world groaning, for climate changing, for the disasters continuing, continuing to be felt in so many people's lives, and born already by those who are often already marginalized. Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come across humanity. Sometimes it baffles our minds to imagine your kingdom of peace, of play, of justice and joy spread across the whole of humanity. And yet we are bold still to pray for peace for nations at war Let your kingdom come. For all of your children, those known, those who are overlooked, those who are crying out this day, Lord, let your kingdom come and surround them with a witness of love and compassion and tenderness and care that will hold on tight with them till the morning. And Lord, we remember all those in our communities, in our families, in our congregation, those who are living with different diseases, diseases in mind, in body, in spirit. We remember that they are all real and that we cannot simply look at one way of faith to be able to tell whether someone is well or not. This day for those who are depressed, for those who are tired, for those who are lonely, for those who have nothing left to hold on. Lord, we cry out on their behalf and pray that our compassion would be widened and our love would be stronger. That empathy would bridge the gaps between us and prove mighty to hold till morning light. 
for all the prayers in our hearts that we don't raise out loud, but that we whisper before you, trusting you to hear them. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in the name of Jesus, who showed us a glimpse of what your kingdom come would look like for transformed community, renewed hope, changed lives, love as the way and it is in that path that we still seek to follow and so we pray now as jesus taught us in whatever words or language we know it best praying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen you to join in our closing hymn rise and body or spirit for there are some things i may not know number 2147 are there any instructions for us as it's new we heard it during the offer right we're good all right good to go it may be new but we're still going to sing it with enthusiasm Just how you feel when Jesus is
What I should have said is that song is, might be new to our community, but it is not new to the community from which it comes. It is a spiritual, and it comes from a community who has long known what it is to hold to faith through long, hard nights. And so we give thanks for their witness that we enjoyed this day. My friends, the invitation that you would go and hold on, trusting that somehow in the mystery of God's goodness, blessing and kingdom living prevail through all the long night, and where you have strength blended to one another till we see the morning light. Let us go this day 